Mino Gizi Good, good afternoon, bonjour. I'm Laura Demers, TD Curator of Education and Outreach Fellow at the Power Plant, and I'm delighted to welcome you on this afternoon um, for a performance lecture by Kai Kello. The year 2019 marks a half century since the Sir George Williams affair, during which students at what is now Concordia University in Montreal occupy the ninth floor of the Hall Building in protest against racial bi bi bias. Through their occupation, the students, immigrants from the Caribbean, members of various black diasporas and their allies, denounced racial, um, uh, racist pedago pedagogy, pedagogical practices and the administration's dismissal of students' concerns. On the final day of the occupation, police entered the building, assaulting and arresting nearly, nearly 100 people. The events on the 14th 14-day occupation remain a traumatic moment in Mo Montreal's history and represents a major instance of black radical action in Canada. Today, Kai will discuss and respond to the lingering legacy of this historical moment. Based in Montreal, Kai Kello is a poet and artist who maintains a strong relationship with the Caribbean with roots in Guyana, South, Africa, South, South America. His books include Magnetic Equator and Dominoes at the Crossroads. His novel, Accordéon, was shortlisted for the Amazon Walrus Foundation First Novel Award. His vo vocal performance, recorded audio, and electronic narrative explore migration and the suspension, suspension of, of arrival. Please help me in welcoming Kai. Hello, friends. Small group, but nice and intimate. So um, I have something that I've worked um, hard on to prepare for you. So I hope that it uh, provokes some thought, and uh, perhaps we can discuss it a little bit afterward. Um, you might get the best relationship to things, especially audio, if you sit closer to the middle. So um, I would invite you to do that. Um, So I'd like to thank uh, Lily and Alan for suggesting me for this event, Laura Demare, Chris Foley and the Power Plant for inviting and hosting me, and Josh Human and the staff at Harborfront for sound and tech. Um, and the occasion of this talk, as you know, is the 50th anniversary of the Sir George Williams Computer Center occupation uh, in Montreal, which played out between January 29th and February 11th, 1969. Uh, this talk is also in the context of Vincent Meeson's exhibit, Blues Claire, at the Power Plant Gallery, and I saw a different iteration of the exhibit um, in January at Concordia at the Leonard and Bina Ellen Art Gallery. Uh, the exhibit references the occupation and centers a performance by a founding member of The Last Poets, Gylan Kane. Um, uh, for my part, my aim is always to foreground the Caribbean, Quebecois, and Canadian experiences. And so I'll kind of approach the exhibit relationally and not necessarily directly. Um, references will be implied by the use of sound in the presentation, but also by the engagement with and uh, preoccupation with art, albeit literature. Um, and I'm overall interested in how a real world event, a political event, can become a vehicle for narrative. Um, so this presentation will, in, will involve, um, it'll sort of be bookended by a bit of discussion, and it'll involve something that I call an electronic narrative. Um, and that, uh, the one that I'll present today, is an excerpt, an extraction from a book of short stories that will come out in the beginning of 2020, uh, called Dominoes at the Crossroads. So this is, this, the excerpt from the story um, is an episode that deals with uh, the, the computer center occupation. Um, but it also takes characters, plucks a character or two from Quebecois experimental fiction of the 60s and places them at the scene of the occupation. Um, it feels odd but also invigorating to be in Toronto to discuss the occupation. The occupation has always felt like a piece of underground history with whose protection Black Montréal has been entrusted. 
It feels underground because it is often buried by mainstream Quebec history. When the FLQ, Quebec nationalism, and the October crisis of 1970 are discussed, and people in my generation have grown up hearing about those events as centerpieces of recent Canadian history, um, little if any reference is made to the occupation. And that is telling because at the very least, the events share a timeline. Uh, in fact, the occupation predated the October crisis, and there is anecdotal evidence of a kind of cultural overlap. And so I would like to proceed anecdotally. Jamaica and Trinidad achieved independence in 1962, Guyana and Barbados in 1966. Many of the 97 who were arrested on February 11th hailed from those countries. Those students were politically active in Montreal in 1968, the year the Black Writers' Congress was held and 1969, when Quebec itself was agitating for its own independence. And some of you may have followed um, the Polaris Music Prize proceedings this year. And if so, you noted a young woman, a jazz and soul singer from Quebec, shortlisted for the prize. Her name is Dominique Fils Aimé. And this past February, um, myself, uh, a friend Nalini Mohabir, and Ronald Cummings, who is also here, among others, um, together organized a, an event series and conference called Protests and Pedagogy around the 50th anniversary of the uh, computer center op occupation. And we flew her father, Philippe Fissemi, from Haiti to Montreal for that commemorative event at Concordia. At one point, we had this a large scale projection mounted. And in one image, which was taken during the 1969 occupation, there were several youthful figures some black and some white, leaning out of one of the large windows of the Concordia Hall building. Um, and if you've ever seen the hall building, it's, the windows look like the windows on an airplane, right? From when you're seen from inside the airplane, it looks like a row upon row of airplane windows, just enlarged and cased in concrete, encased in concrete. Um, at the event, Philippe Fissemé approached me and in his, his, his really characteristic and charming way asked me, do you recognize anybody in that picture? And I said, no, I didn't recognize anybody. And he told me to look closer. So I did, but I still didn't recognize anyone. And he pointed to one of the young men and said, that handsome young man right there, that's me. And the man next to me, do you recognize him? The man next to Philip was white, with messy hair, and as a sign of the times, a thick mustache. It was Paul Rose, who was at the time, and, and after as well, probably the most prominent of the FLQ leaders, who was later convicted of the murder of Pierre Laporte. The computer center occupation was violently broken up by police on February 11th. On February 13th, 1969, a bomb was detonated in the stock exchange, injuring 27 people. That bomb was planted by the FLQ. And this is certainly not to suggest that the Caribbean students were involved with the FLQ, but rather that their agitation for equality and justice happened downtown Montréal at the height of the movement for Quebec independence and at the precise moment at which the FLQ's actions took a more militant and fatal turn. Members of the FLQ were present at the occupation and were supportive. At the very least, this indicates a compelling interweaving of timelines, individual, political, and cultural. The occupation also feels like part of a secret history because outside of Quebec, it seems to be rarely discussed. Although there are many, many people of my generation whose parents arrived in Canada, in Montréal, around 1969. Recall that Montréal was the largest city in Canada, and in 1967, it had just played host to Expo. Thousands of old and new Canadians, Caribbeans among them, had some connection to Montreal, to Sir George. Many of those people dispersed across the country and raised families. My mother was one such person. I found this out because, in September 2000, the Prime Minister of Dominica, Rosie Douglas, who was one of the students who had participated in the occupation and been arrested, um, came to Concordia to speak. I was in attendance. A few weeks later, in October 2000, I was in Calgary visiting family. 
my mother and I were on our way to a West Indian grocer in the northeast quadrant of the city. In the grocery, I picked up a copy of the Jamaica Gleaner, in which there was a story about Rosie Douglas having just passed away. I was surprised, and I showed the story to my mother, who was equally surprised. And she told me that although they had not known one another directly, they had moved in similar social circles and seen one another on numerous occasions. She remembered him clearly. A few days before that, Pierre Elliott Trudeau had died, and my mother recalled how, in 1970, during the October crisis, after Trudeau's invoking of the War Measures Act, her downtown Montreal student apartment, along with many others in the same neighborhood, was entered and searched by police. The timelines align, and the various narratives of immigration, of student life, of Caribbean independence, of Quebec nationalism, and Quebec's own struggle for French self-definition and linguistic equality, the FLQ and its escalating violence, Caribbean student radicalism in the face of discrimination in academia and in society, black and white Quebecois agitation for a future, and the attempt by the federal government to contain and control Quebec, its imperial dominion, all inform the same grand narrative of that era. Yet the story of the computer center occupation has somehow been isolated and extracted, and that hole that its extraction has left has been seamed shut. As a poet and fiction writer, my concern is often with narrative, with how it is constructed, because the structure of our narratives is the mechanism by which we assemble and understand our reality. An editor once said to me, on receiving a draft of a manuscript of a novel, there must be a hierarchy among narratives. And I find that the richest advice I have ever received about writing fiction the richest advice I have ever received about how others filter experience. It leads me to ask several questions, namely, how do we decide what narrative sits atop that hierarchy and which ones are suppressed? Because if there is a hierarchy, some suppression is inevitable. It also leads me to ask how it is possible to formally and structurally subvert that hierarchy while still maintaining some form of coherence. In the case of Philippe Fis Aimé and the photograph, which placed the Caribbean student radicals next to the FLQ members in the Sir George Williams Hall building during the occupation, that photo flattened the hierarchy among narratives. In fact, it reflects the idea that the hierarchy was never there in the first place, at least not in the picture. In the case of my mother's story, her experience as an immigrant and Caribbean student did not carry any less weight in her mind than her experience as a Canadian observing federal politics. So the concern that has always lingered with me as a person born of Caribbean and Canadian heritage is how to rework narrative in a way that is of the Caribbean diaspora, but also imbued with the realities, sights, sounds, experiences, and in humanities of this place. Every year toward the end of January, I think of a film I'd like to direct. I can't decide what its defining genre would be, but it would start with a tightly framed shot of a man who looks like me. The shot would open outward, gradually. He, I, wearing a lightweight gray wool suit, would be on the ninth floor of the Concordia University Hall building, glancing left and right, deciding which way to go. As I decide, color slowly bleeds from the film. The walls, the doors, the linoleum, the thin metal of the lockers become a grainy, faded sepia. I hear my name shouted. My scalp tingles. I don't know who is shouting, but I know I have to hurry to them. I turn down an endless corridor bordered by lockers. The corridor bends until it seems I've traveled in a circle. I stop. I look back. The corridor continues in both directions. I look ahead and realize I'm shifting gears in my Opel, hugging the curves on a narrow street near Lausanne. The road squiggles and winds through forest, and the sunlight flashes down between the trees, glazing my windshield for a second before giving way to shadow. The opal accelerates, and just as I round a corner, I see the car I'm chasing, a copper Volvo, 
I accelerate. The amphetamines I swallowed before breakfast sharpen my focus. And as sweat dapples my forehead, the road bends again, and I lose sight of the Volvo. The trees cast a mottled shadow on the sinewy road, which becomes a corridor again, bordered by tan lockers. The voices grow louder, and I realize I'm holding my breath. The corridor never reaches the voices. They trail into a thin wail, and I slow down. I can see black smoke at the far end of the corridor, billowing along the ceiling toward me, and I hear a crackling sound that gets louder the farther I go. The air gets hot, and the corridor closes in. I have to backtrack. The voices recede. My heart rate accelerates, and its speeding and slowing become the soundtrack to the film, a low thump that resonates through the building. At this point, I always wonder whether I am the building and whether everything in the film is actually happening somewhere inside me. I get lost in a recursive image of a small me struggling to negotiate the internal passages of a larger me. A fire alarm rings, and the alarm is red iron tongues in red mouths. The voices clang and scream over my heartbeat. I stand in the narrow passage and strain my ears, but the voices, the alarm, seem to be sounding from every direction. I have to cover my ears. They are screaming, Hamidou, Hamidou. But just as I think I'm approaching the room they're locked into, as my fingers encircle the doorknob, I recoil in anguish, scorched. I have to backtrack. Then I'm alone in the quiet corridor. Its lockers, linoleum, and fluorescent lights gleam far ahead of me. I look in one direction and another, and the process restarts, then grows increasingly harrowing before fading and restarting again. After a few repetitions, I understand the parameters of the adventure, as one understands the rules of a video game, and I know that my goal is to locate and rescue students while avoiding a fire, but with each repetition, just as a map of the corridors germinates in my thoughts, and the location of the fire and the voices become clear, the film plot introduces another nuance. I hear a troop of footfalls, of hard boot heels on linoleum, and I know that stomping is the police. I don't know whether the police are chasing me or whether they're looking for the students. I do know that if the police stumble upon me, they will arrest me before I reach the students, and if they reach the students first, they will swing their truncheons before making arrests. I start to navigate the corridors with an ear to the students, an ear to the police footfalls, and a wariness of the fire. The film introduces another complication. The corridors fill with smoke. To avoid suffocating, I have to proceed on my knees crawling through the corridors while holding my lapel over my nose and mouth. On my knees in the corridors, the students' voices get lost in the smoke. I can no longer locate the footsteps. I know that I can't outwit the police, the smoke, the labyrinthine corridor, that it will gradually entrap me. I also know that the film is not an adventure, but an ungainly hybrid of psychological thriller, horror, and historical documentary informed by an episode that remains unresolved and, unless I can resolve the episode outside the film, I will forever be trapped inside the vertiginous narrative. My objective then becomes to escape the narrative before it ensnares me. Every December a small shoot of worry insinuates itself into my days. I think ahead to February, and I worry that it may be my last year to make the hybrid documentary and that if I don't do it, one of two scenarios will arise. Someone else will produce a film in their own fashion, or the episode will be collectively forgotten. Either way, my own aesthetic reckoning with that moment will never be expressed. I worry about the intensity of my obsession. A third scenario presents itself. What if I make a poor film? I know nothing about film. I don't watch movies and I have never practiced any of the arts. I don't know how to think about plot. Some years a traditional plot, with its rising action, 
climax and denouement suggests itself, while other years it expands in an infinite and exhausting maze. On January 29th, the day the Concordia Computer Center was occupied in 1969, dreams begin. They intensify until February 11th, when they reach their peak, then they disperse. Their dispersal coincides with a release from any desire for recognition that can, or any feelings of urgency about making the film. This past January, I returned from a visit to Senegal, where I bought a wooden elephant from an outdoor market. The elephant's body was hollowed out, and according to the craftsman, it could be used to score human ashes, money, dreams, regrets, juju, jewelry, memory, anything I wanted. I placed the elephant in the center of my dining table, and often before I went to sleep I would look at it, taking a drink of water, and it would be the last thing in my thoughts before I drifted off. Most days I was groggy and depleted by my late night contemplation of the film. It often felt like I was walking around in a haze. The haze could thin out to reveal reality, or it could become subtle hallucinations. I might look up from my copy of The Contract, a near unreadable Caribbean community paper in which I advertise my shop and my goods, and which I pick up as a habit and spread out on the counter. And the faces of people in the newspaper might resemble the masks on my wall, and vice versa. Or, out of the corner of my eye, the spindly statues that stand around the store might shift position. They might lift a leg, move a few steps to the left, or turn their head to face the door. When I looked back at them, they would be standing immobile. Or I might be in the middle of reading an article when the words would sound in my thoughts like they were being spoken, and for a moment voices would seem to issue from my statues and masks. People might enter my store and ask me a question in English, and I might answer in Wolof. The hallucinations were worse this past year than in any previous year, so when I saw a picture of one of my regular customers, Tamika Brown, in the contract, I thought my mind was producing the illusion. Tamika visited the store at least once a week on her way to and from Concordia. She assertively bargained but never bought anything. I closed the paper, then walked around the store and muttered the name Tamika Brown three times, thinking that if I invoked her by repeating her name, any imposter spirit would be frightened away. I opened the contract again to the same page, and the picture of Tamika was still there. So I glanced down at the article to see if it was readable, or if its sentences turned into snakes. Local scholar awarded grant to research Grenadian history. I kept wondering whether my mind was inventing the article as I went, and I kept blinking, squinting, waiting for the lines of type to wriggle. They didn't. I was doubly surprised when Tamika wandered into the store. She smiled at me. I squinted again. I put on my glasses and looked down at the paper and then back at her. Tamika paused, then asked me if I was all right. Euh, oui, oui, euh, juste un peu, peu euh, étourdi ma chère. Still, I tilted my glasses to the edge of my nose and stared down at the photo in the contract, then back at Tamika as she browsed. Both versions of Tamika, the print version and the flesh, continued to exist simultaneously. We discussed the price of a wooden giraffe and, as usual, couldn't find a mutually satisfactory figure. So she browsed the necklaces and amulets in silence, and I offered, Si tu trouves quelque chose que tu aimes, je peux te faire un prix. She thanked me, continued browsing, then waved as she wandered out. That night I researched Tamika Brown online. I found a paper she wrote as a graduate student at Concordia on the 40th anniversary of the 1969 occupation of the computer center. She referenced maps of the ninth floor of the hall building, maps from 1969, before any renovations had been made, in which she pinpointed where the students had barricaded themselves into the computer center, where the police were stationed, and where the fires were lit. The students were blamed for lighting the fires, and the newspapers reported this, yet, on being arrested, 
Many students admitted to vandalizing university property and tossing boxes of punch cards out a smashed window. Tamika's paper stressed, however, that the students refused to accept responsibility for smashing the computers or lighting the fires. Many students even claimed that the police themselves smashed the computers to intimidate the students and exaggerate the extent of the damage, a tactic that would increase the charges laid, and that the police also lit the fires. The paper notes that the fires were lit in a place that blocked the most convenient route to the escalators and stairs. The escalators and stairs, the two means of escape, were then accessible by one circuitous route which traveled the narrow corridors that curved outside the computer center, then bent back behind a lecture hall and re-emerged on the other wing of the floor, where the police were conveniently stationed. I fell asleep reading Tamika's paper. I dreamed that I was on the set of my film, with her paper crumpled in my jacket pocket. I was navigating the ninth floor corridors. In my dream I knew what was going to happen to the students, and I knew who lit the fire, but I still couldn't do anything about it. That knowing made the dream burn. The corridors sweltered, the police footsteps charged, the smoke swelled, and I was near frantic in my search. I knew the students would be arrested and beaten, and when I finally had to crawl beneath the gathering smoke, I choked and coughed and felt myself losing consciousness on the linoleum. I woke up sweating, and I sat up in the dark and almost wept when the dream finally dissipated. But even as it dissipated, it seemed to leave a dark dye in my thoughts, and that dye seeped down through me. I got up, and as I flipped on the light in the kitchen, I saw the elephant. Its wood gleamed black. I stared at the elephant, that majestic, long-memoried animal, and then I opened the compartment on its back. It was hollowed out. I left the compartment open, and I allowed my memory to travel back to 1969. I had just returned from a failed covert engagement in Lausanne, and my employer, my employer who was the government of Quebec, a nation struggling to determine its identity and its future, just like many of the nations in Africa and the Caribbean, offered me the chance to redeem myself in its eyes. I summoned this memory and poured it into the elephant. I recalled office numbers, the names of government officers and their precise titles. I recalled who smoked cigarettes and who didn't, and I recalled the brands. I recalled whose office had windows and whose occupied a corner. I recalled who bro drove a brown Datsun, who drove a chrome Peugeot, and who drove a compact gold Fiat. I recalled exact conversations and poured them, in their entirety, into the elephant. I recalled being tasked to infiltrate the student movement. I recalled looking at building plans of the ninth floor, at the layout of the narrow labyrinthine corridors, the passage that traveled behind the lecture hall, the location of the stairs and the escalator. I was instructed on how to pressure the students to more radical action and to push them toward a criminal blunder. I recalled the names of the men who encouraged me and the exact words they used and I poured all of that sepia-toned nostalgia into the elephant. I recalled being told that the specifics of this engagement could only be detailed verbally and could not be written down. I also recalled a particular Montréal police captain who was present at each of these meetings. I recalled the exact circumference of his stomach, and I recalled his remark that it was good to have un bon black de notre côté a good black on our side, which made the other officers laugh, and which he thought I didn't hear. I delivered all of those memories to the elephant. I recalled attending the student meetings and revealing what my employer had requested of me, and then returning to my employer and delivering a mix of accurate information and falsehoods as subtle as the narrow winding corridors that gradually cloud a person's sense of direction in the same way that the back streets of the old port did, or the convoluted neural pathways a memory travels, as it is recalled, misleading, directionless falsehoods about what the students were planning. I recalled this deliberate, duplicitous crossing of the hemispheres, north and south, and I told it all to the elephant. 
Finally, I recalled the meeting at which I was asked to set a fire on the ninth floor, and I said that I would do it. After the meeting, I went to stand outside the hall building on De Maisonneuve Boulevard. It was the middle of February, and I looked up to the ninth floor and hoped that the students would be safe, and I knew they would be herded to their arrest, that they might be beaten and insulted, and instead of entering the hall building to light the fire, I vanished into the city. I walked along De Maisonneuve Boulevard until I found the entrance to the Peel Metro Tunnel, and I rode the escalator underground. I gave all of this to the elephant, in all of its detail. I recalled the exact number of snowflakes that fell that day, and the faces of the people I passed on the street. I remembered everything, and once I delivered it to the elephant, I closed the compartment. I planned to give the elephant to the historian, with a word of caution. It contained a memory, and if it were opened, that memory would rush out like a swarm of bats in the dusk of Dakar. So uh, a couple of those characters in the collection of fiction that, that will come out uh, early next year, they kind of recur. Tamika Brown is this historian. She studies the Grenada Revolution, um, and she writes about that. And Hamidou Diop is a, is a very, he's probably the most famous um, minor character in Quebec history, in the history of Quebec literature. He appears for about like 61 words, I think, in a novel by Hubert Aquin called Prochain Episode. The novel was published in 1968, a Senegalese double agent. And then he vanishes. And his appearance is totally inexplicable. It, it cannot be understood why Hubert Aquin would have included a Senegalese double agent in his work only to have the Senegalese double agent vanish. I have my own theories about that. but So I always find Hemi Doudiop and put him in other places throughout history and kind of try to embellish him and, and, and make him uh, appear in different scenarios and um, contribute to different struggles and different uh, covert engagements, different revolutions. So, um, uh, and he does appear a couple of times in the upcoming book. Uh, I find great solace in being inside a narrative. And by that I mean not just a story of my own imagining, but one that predates and encompasses me. One that helps to clarify the reasons why I'm here now, the material conditions of my existence, and how I relate to others in my society. This reflects the importance of being situated, the sense that an individual life takes on greater significance when it locks into others. I have often felt that as a first generation black Canadian from Western Canada, I'm outside of history, which is not necessarily a lonely place to be. There's very good company here. There are brilliant artists, authors, theorists, and radical strategists. I do feel that this condition of being marooned outside of history is the driving condition behind my writing, a kind of hunger, but not to write myself into the history that excludes and marginalizes, rather to contribute to a much broader current that sprawls outside of the official. In that gap between what happens and what gets recounted, and from which perspective, much of the world resides. Everything we don't see, everything we don't permit ourselves to see, informs the divide between occurrence and narration. What we construct is only often a few thin strands plucked from a what actually happened, strands that serve our convenience. One of the best expositions of this gap was a preamble that Dion Brand gave to her reading of an early version of the manuscript that would later become The Blue Clerk, her most recent work of poetry. The reading was given around 2015 at Concordia University. And so the book came out last year. So between you know, 2015 and 2018 was last year? I mean, that's a long time. You know, that A long time goes by when you're working on a manuscript and you're getting editorial input. So in 2015, she was in a very different place with that manuscript, I would imagine. Um, she said that as a writer, what she chooses to record is just a fragment of what she discards. What she chooses to record goes to the right-hand page, 
whereas what she selects from and pushes to the side for whatever reason forms an ever-mounting stack of versos or left-hand pages, the pages that are turned away. And that is the discrepancy between how life events unfold in the world and how we narrate them. But in The Blue Clerk, the effort is made to observe and catalog all that was shuffled away. In that act of recovering the versos, in that conceptual turn away from what is selected and toward what is overlooked, we are offered an opening into a unique Caribbean-Canadian approach to writing. With the events at Sir George Williams, those who were supposed to be quietly shuffled away were the ones who occupied the narrative. In a remarkable gesture, I mean, one that created probably one of the most iconic images in Canadian history that nobody's aware of, um, they tossed hundreds of punch cards out the window to flutter down and scatter over De Maisonneuve Boulevard. And I mean, a punch card is about this size, right? It's a little bit taller, a little bit narrower, uh, the ones that they were using at Concordia at the time. Um, as if the punch cards were pages in a derelict manuscript that needed to be reshuffled as they were rewritten, or as if the punch cards represented possible futures that were being withheld and by scattering the cards in the air, those possibilities were being liberated and redistributed. The occupation involved a diversity of participants whose perspectives vary along age, class, culture, color, and other lines. So how are we appro to approach the story of that redistribution? This past winter, during the protests and pedagogy conference, one of the main concerns that emerged seemed to be through whose eyes should we look at the occupation? Some prominent journalists suggested that the story of Perry Anderson, the offending professor, has never been properly told, that he is the centerpiece of the events and a forgotten man, to quote one article. There was also the valid and overdue view to which we devoted significant time that the stories of the women present during the occupation were not substantially represented. Another approach that has only been explored in a limited fashion is that of the local black community and how its elder and younger members reacted to the events as they were unfolding in the media. The idea of the unexplored or suppressed perspective is rife with narrative possibilities, although I hesitate here because my aim is not to say that the occupation is like a resource whose stories need to be extracted and exploited. What I mean is something more akin to referencing the occupation in a bid to create uni unique cultural forms that are native to a particular place and imbued with the black experience of that place. As a fiction writer, I would take my cue from Marise Condé, who, when asked about what makes a novel Caribbean, offered, you have to find the Caribbean technique of telling a story, a polyphonous technique. And she goes on, to mix chapters in the first person, chapters in the third person, to mix female and male voices, and especially mix the people who are supposed to be important. Simply, a Caribbean story could not really be told without reference to servants. Don't forget that, after all, as a black person, I descend from slaves, and the slaves were always silent, forced to be silent. They knew they were the real masters of the island. She later sums up by saying that this approach to the novel is both an artistic and a political device. And whether a writer follows Condé's advice or not, or follows her device or not, the point is that she is identifying the particular properties that create a form for and an approach to the novel that is rooted in the Caribbean experience. The computer center occupation has the potential to be a strong vehicle for narrative. It too can unify the political and the artistic. It is a major instance of group-directed black radical action in Canada and it is among the largest student protests in Canadian history. In fact, it surpassed protest and became occupation. Its main complainants and participants were drawn from a group whose voices weren't considered ones that should resonate in the national dialogue. Its artistic import can be perceived in the way it creates a form that we can impose on how we narrate as black people in Canada, a form that is descended from its Caribbean antecedents, but one that is local, rooted in local circumstance. And the form that I perceive in looking at the occupation is, I mean, I mean one, just one thing that comes to mind is a kind of hub whose metaphysical spokes radiate outward across the country, overseas and across time as well. 
In a way, the occupation is inexhaustible. All of its stories can never be told, and all of the people who were moved by it and perhaps emboldened and shaped by it are still being counted. Further to this, its influence on Quebec and Canadian culture can't be overestimated. We cannot discuss the multiculturalism of the 1980s and 1990s without considering the occupation. The October crisis and the nationalist agitation of the late 1960s in Quebec were anticipated by the occupation. The 2012 student strike, but these are broad strokes, and compelling as they are, any popular narrative is carried along by its characters and can really begin to be understood once we hear the stories of the individuals who were present, what they brought to the moment, and how they were transformed by the events. And by characters, we can locate extended families of people who were, in one way or another, present during or witness to or in proximity of or aware of the events. Although I was not present in 1969, I would like to add a personal note to these reflections, and this is where I would like to end. I grew up in Vancouver and Calgary, where the Caribbean communities are considerably newer and smaller than in Toronto and Montreal. In the 1980s, it often felt like it was dangerous to become too visible, that our communities had to stay quiet, and aside from hosting a summer carnival at which food and music were offered, any more substantial advocacy was risky and had to remain muted. This may not have been true, but it was my impression growing up. My impression was that in order to become a fully formed, balanced human being, I had to leave Western Canada and find a place where Caribbean people, and I'm including the Antilles in this as well, Haiti, Guadeloupe, Martinique, Guyane, and so on, existed in greater numbers. When I moved to Montreal in my early 20s, I found this, but I was also introduced to the Sir George occupation, and I was shocked when I first heard about it. It was a kind of revelatory shock, one that recalibrated me instantly, reconstructed my relationship to the city of Montreal. It had the same effect that that first visit home has on a person who is born here. The second you step out of the plane onto the ramp, you come into close relation with a narrative that includes you but exceeds you. Still, you see your place in it. You recognize all of your relations coming and going. I wanted to live in a place where people like me had authored a unique passage and where it would be possible for me to make my own distinct contribution. To go from having very little history in a place to having an inheritance like the occupation, a moment in which an earlier generation had articulated themselves publicly, had demanded equal rights and justice, had disrupted the common quotidian efforts to diminish and erase their presence, had wielded their brilliance and assertiveness in the national spotlight, and had in fact commanded the national spotlight, was reminiscent of a moment in science fiction where the crew travels through a wormhole and finds themselves on the other side of the galaxy, staring about in wonder. The main organizer of the protests and pedagogy conference, a friend, Nalini Mohabir, was fond of mentioning that in occupying the computer center in 1969, which was the year of the moon landing, the students had occupied the idea of the future. And I would like to add that by tossing the punch cards out the university window, they symbolically redistributed access to the idea of the future. And that act allowed my generation to exist in a way that was more complete, more coherent perhaps, and that was certainly more complex than what this society was planning to permit us. Suddenly here was a Caribbean Canadian narrative, one that branched directly from the grand diasporan one, one in which we had suddenly become actors. Thank you for coming this afternoon, and um, I think we have a few minutes. If anybody has any questions, you can either ask here or perhaps go out into the hall, into the sunlight. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. <laughs>